G'day and welcome back. On the last video we looked at this Arvin and uh, reconditioned this one and this is brilliant. I love this radio. And if you recall I had three radios and I had two of the Arvins and I had another one. And that was this Emerson. I wasn't going to worry about this one but uh, people have said I hope you're going to do the Emerson next so okay I'll do that now. So let's have a closer look at this radio. As is my normal routine I haven't had a look at this particularly well. I haven't got any information on it. I don't know who Emerson is. I don't know anything about it. Now the first thing that stands out is this little light on the top and I don't think that's original. I have no idea what that's for. We'll have a look in a minute. And the other thing is this glass. And it appears to be glued on the front. It, I, it certainly isn't original that way. I'm sure it came in from the back. So the glass has broken, the original glass, and someone's just glued a bit on the front, which works, so why not? The other thing that's odd is this pointer. I don't know if that's original. It looks a little bit odd. It looks a bit small or plasticky or something. Uh, it may well be the right one. I don't know. Uh, the dial has uh, got uh, killer cycles on the top and it's got uh, meters on the bottom. So that would indicate this radio is a bit older than 50s, probably pre-50 I would think. The knobs are a bit strange as well. They, it almost looks like someone's painted them. If I can get one off. <coughs> That doesn't look original. These are brown plastic and I see they've sort of been painted, I think. The case itself looks pretty good. Um, can't see any cracks or anything in it. Nice thick Bakelite too. That's not... I noticed this little mono jacks down here and it's backwards, so I'm not sure why it's facing outwards. And it's got the North American plug on it. It's got a big crack in there, but I mean, that's not going to stop it working. don't think that's too dangerous. The lead's pretty good. Now I just realised, of course, this back is on the wrong way. It should be flipped over so the smooth side of the hardboard is facing out. Anyway, I'll take these screws off and we'll have a look inside. I've taken the screws out. We'll see what's in there. What's that say? To change tubes, remove screw. Do not disconnect wires. Move loop aside. Well, there's no screw there. Now, there is a little bracket inside here for where it used to screw on, but the screw's gone. Just having a peek in here, this is quite old. It's got the old octals in there as well. So, uh, yeah, this is certainly before 50s, I would think. There's some wires. They're coming from the speaker, so somebody's used that to plug in a little headphone. There's screws on the bottom. I'll just put this on its back and take the screws out, and we should be able to lift the chassis off. Oh, here's the model number as well, 518. Okay, let's see what we got in here. Mm, don't want to come off. Oh, there it is. Um, I thought this may have had a transformer on due to the weight, but uh, yeah, it's not. It's a All American Five again. I've put a screw in here just to hold that antenna. I don't want to break anything on it. I'll flip it over. Have a look at the bottom. That's quite clean under here. Plenty of the standard waxies. There's the electrolytic. There's the oscillator coil, and that's not adjustable. Here's one of the power leads going off to the switch, and from there it goes on to one of the valves, and another lead goes up the end here somewhere. This capacitor here is a 0.2 at 200 volts. That's coming straight off that hot lead there uh, to ground. So that's a suppression capacitor. This one up here looks like the across the line capacitor. This looks like it's been deep fried. Doesn't look too bad, but it's bubbled up. I don't know if that indicates it's been getting pretty hot. This electrolytic smoothing cap, it looks like it's trying to exit the building. Uh, so it may have been stressed as well. It may be just dried out and just going that way, of course. I think the best thing to do now is go and get the schematic. I've got the model number now, so I'll go and get that and come back in a second. I've managed to get a circuit diagram, and I've just been looking at it for a little while. Uh, there's the line in, and that goes along here. It goes through this filament in the rectifier, comes out, runs along here through this surge resistor, and sits on the plate of the rectifier. And the other line goes through the switch and is a B-, minus, I guess. Uh, for the return path. This B- minus goes to the chassis through a capacitor and a, a resistor and that'll be the 0 0.02 we looked at before. So the line voltage is coming along here, it goes through that filament and then down as I said it sits on the top of this plate. It also goes off and does all the other filaments. That means all the power that this radio is consuming goes through that little bit of filament. If this area up here has a high current draw, something fails, uh, that filament's going to get overloaded I would think. Yeah, I just don't get why you'd put all that through the one little filament, but uh, obviously they do. Uh, there's a reason for it. Uh, people that know about these radios would say, yeah, that's pretty normal or it's not unusual. So just getting back to it, we've got your uh, active on one side here, and this is the B-. So that'll be the across-the-line capacitor. 
that goes up there, sits on the uh, plate. So it gets rectified, comes along here, up here, and presents at the center tap of this output transformer. This, this is something I've never seen. I guess they're using it as a choke to filter out the uh, power supply. I think I've worked all that out. It's a pretty simple circuit. The only thing I'm stuck on is sending everything through the one little filament. So, um, so that just seems odd, but I'll accept that that's what it does, and it works. There's an addendum drawing here below the main one we're just looking at. And what they've done there is just replace that center tapped uh, output transformer with a standard one, a more conventional one. Uh, and they've added a bit of a resistance in there and also another capacitor. What I would normally do is just very carefully power these radios up on the dim bulb and see how they react. But with this one having everything going through the filament, I, I'm not too keen on doing that. Uh, if this has got a short in it, it's going to go straight back to the ground. Uh, so I'm going to change that one and I'll probably change that one too. Another thing I'm going to do is test all these tubes before I put power on it. That way I'll know that they're good, and if I do something to break them, I'll know that I'm the one that stuffed it up. I'll pull all these valves out now and test them. I'm going to try something a little different. I'll see if I can test them in 30 seconds. I'm all set. I've got my tester set up, got the valves ready, got my book open. I'm ready to go. Start the timer. Now, if anyone was worried about my hand, of course I didn't really stab it, that's tomato sauce. But what I did find is this 12 uh, SQ7 is defective. It, it does work, but it's very, very weak. And the dyads don't register at all. Um, so uh, it probably would still work to some degree if I need to, but I'm trying to get a new one. But until I do, I'll carry on with some other repairs. I think the logical first step would be to have a look at this uh, capacitor here, the smoothing capacitor. It is trying to get out the bottom there, so with a bit of luck I might be able to just pull this out and re-stuff the original tube. As usual, the capacitor's held on with this band. The band's poked through a hole there and it's soldered to the chassis, so I'm going to have to go and get the big iron out and melt that off. I've got my big soldering iron warming up outside, so while it's doing that, uh, I'll unsolder these wires. There's a green one going on here, there's a red one here, and the black one's going over here. And I've made a little mud map so I can remember where they are because I've videoed it I can just go back on the video so give me a second and I'll desolder those wires I've got the wires out I have to say it was a struggle they wrap them around the little tags there about three times so I'll just go and remove this lump of solder on the front and I'll come back I've unsoldered it it's got to try and get out of here but I have to get it past this transformer so obviously this was put in first hmm. All right. All right. The capacitor is 30 and 50 microfarad, and they've put the band over the color coding. So uh, uh, that one's green, that's black for negative, and uh, well, red, obviously. So uh, this plug's trying to get out, so uh, it's pretty hard. Whoa. Yeah. I might do this outside, <laughs> it's going to make a mess everywhere. And it keeps going. I'll just try and um, dig away at it outside, so there's chips going everywhere here. And see what I can get at. These things contain chemicals that probably you shouldn't be uh, touching or smelling, so I'll put some gloves on, a mask, and I'll just go and try and dig this out. The inside lining started to come out so I've just drilled a hole in a bit of wood here and I'll put that in there and I'm going to push down on a bit of dowel hopefully it'll come out the bottom yep 
Yeah, it needs a bit more than the push, obviously. Oh, well, just fell apart. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, there's not too much damage. That's not too bad at all, actually. Now, it had a black uh, cardboard end there that's a bit ruined, so I'll just make another one. Um, provided I can get some capacitors to fit in here, I think that'll be good. Well, that came out pretty much what I thought. We can get that um, sleeve that's in there that they wrap it in, push it in here. If we can get that to let go, uh, it'll come out. So um, I haven't got any capacitors. The ones I've got to fit it are way too big. So I've ordered some new ones. And the ones I've ordered are only about 20 millimeters long. This is about 70 mil or so long. So uh, I'll just put this aside until I get those caps in and then I'll restuff this one. The way this is all unfolding with the valve and now the capacitor, I think what I'll do is go through and change all these capacitors and check all the resistors. And hopefully when all that's done, I'll have the parts I need to try and plug it in and make sure it works. This morning I'm going to replace all these capacitors. As I said, I've checked all the resistors in here and they are all perfect. They're absolutely spot on. Uh, the only one I can't do is this 15 meg one here. It's measuring at 3 meg, so there's another circuit around there somewhere. So I'll have to unsolder one end and, and just recheck that one. So I'll get busy and I'll be back in a second. All right, I've replaced all those capacitors. I didn't have to replace any resistors at all. I did pull this resistor here. This is 15 meg and it's perfect. Yeah, so that was a bit of luck. It saved a lot of work. This line to chassis is an ordinary capacitor. And the same for the across the line capacitor here. I'm just waiting on delivery of the appropriate safety caps to put in there, but they'll do while I test it all. Here's the casualty list so far, and I've included the smoothing cap as well, because obviously I've pulled the inards out and I'll restuff that one. I think the next thing to do is go and clean this up. The chassis is not as good as the Arvin. It's got a bit of corrosion on it. It's not very heavy, and the speaker's got a fair bit of corrosion on it. But I think what I'll do is take the speaker off. If I desolder the antenna, I can take that off, and that'll give me access to the chassis. So I'll do all that now. Here's the pointer I just took off and it's plastic. I don't know if this is the original or not. It's got a hole right through it and a little raised bit about the hole. The hole's off center. I guess it looks like a pointer. I'm not sure if it's the original pointer though. With all the accessories removed, I can get a pretty good shot at cleaning this now. So I'll take it out in the shed and we'll have a go at that. Now, because my transport is on the fritz, I've had to carry this out by myself. You can see the circles here where the valves were sitting and it's clean in there and not out there. So I'll just see what it actually is on there. Oh, look at that, <laughs> it's just, just rubbing off. Wow, okay. Oh, I thought I was in for a tough time there. Oops. It's just got a little layer of corrosion on it as well. I'll spray a bit of uh, cleaner on there as well. It's not coming off quite as well as I initially thought, so it needs some sort of very mild abrasive as well. Um, I might use a, try a bit of gumption on it. Gumption's just a pre-mixed uh, abrasive powder. So it's in a cream form, it's not a powder, sorry. What if I put some, put, put some cleaner with the gumption? Now that's coming out really well, it's, I've almost polished it, so uh, probably a bit over the top. Uh, screws here that are coming through from the bottom, and I think I'll tip flip it over and drop them out for a second and just clean around them. I can't get to them with that screw there, um, but I think that's pretty good. It, it still has some corrosion spots in it, but gosh, who cares, 70, 70 years old, it's doing all right. Those two screws are holding on the output transformer, so I've just let one go. I'll clean around it, put it back and do the other one. I've cleaned around the two screws and put them back and uh, it's coming up okay so I'll just do the rest of it and uh, we'll have a look when I've finished. Alright I've cleaned that up and that's about as good as I want to go. It's not perfect but um, it's pretty good. The next thing I need to do is look at this speaker. It's just got a layer of corrosion, very fine corrosion on it. Um, I don't think there's much I can do. I might just wipe it off I think. I don't think I can, you know, if I start getting too carried away I'll end up having to paint it or something. I'll just put a bit of cleaner on it and see how it responds. 
yes, uh, not making much difference there. All right, so what I ended up doing is running over it with a scarer. So it's kind of cleaned it a little bit. It's a bit shinier. Yeah, it's, it's nothing flash, but it looks a little bit better. I'm going to assemble it all. I'll put the uh, tubes back in. Put everything back on. Uh, there was a lead on here going to that little jack on the back of the uh, radio. I took that off. That was for a headphone or something. So the wire is now uh, directly wired to the speaker like it should be. I've left the dial plate off until a bit later on. I've put the SQ7 in uh, even though it's not very good. Uh, I've ordered a new one and it's on its way. If it gets to the stage where we can power it up before the new one gets here, uh, I'm sure that'll work to some degree. Now something I haven't done is check the output transformer and if that's gone crook I'm in trouble. So I'm going to check it now, I'll flip this over. Here's the output transformer, a uh, bit hard to see, there's three wires there. So that's coming around to here. Uh, that wire, the centre wire is going to here and there's another black wire and that's coming around to here and that's it there. I've set my multimeter up, uh, one wire was here so I can clip onto that one. And the other one was here, so that's easy enough. I'll just clip on there. And that should be going right across the coil. And we've got 179. Uh, so we'll call it 180. I'll take that one off. If I go to this red lead here, I should think we'll get, uh, what, 80. And we've got 172. Um, uh, so I'll go on here again uh, onto that one. What are we going to get there? Seven. So 172, 700, and, yeah, so that's equal. So that isn't centre tapped, that's obviously tapped very much off centre. I just assumed it was centre tapped uh, looking at the drawing. Uh, that's not quite what I expected, but uh, the output transformer is working, so that's the main thing. It's uh, pretty late in the day, so I'm going to pack up. I've got the spare parts coming tomorrow. What time in the day, I don't know, but in the meantime, I, perhaps I'll look at the case when I get up in the morning. It's very early in the morning. Um, I've got up so I can start working on this case. And one of the things that sticks out is this little pilot light on the top here. Now, I thought someone had added it. And I thought it was a lamp, but it's not. It's it's simply a little clear lens, a red lens there. The dial light sits behind it and it would light up when the dial light was on. I've looked at hundreds of photos of this radio. I have not seen one with that in there. But the parts list for this radio uh, calls for a dial crystal on this model. So is that it? Is that what it is? There's no light behind it. And in fact, it just pops out. And the hole drilled in it is very neat, and I think this is done in the factory. Now, when I got this radio, it had this piece of uh, glass, and it, it's actually Perspex. I thought it was glass. And that was stuck in there somehow, uh, and just glued in. But, just looking at the inside here, there's some adhesive left on there. I think this had a thin plastic lens uh, that went in from the inside, so I'm going to have to try and recreate that. Before I take it outside to clean it, I'll just get this handle off here. It's just a couple of split pins. All right, I'll take this out in the shed and we'll give it a polish. I'm a little concerned with this one. I'm not sure how well it's going to come up. If you can see along here, it's kind of motley or wrinkled looking. Uh, that's in the casting. Uh, here's not looking real flash either. So I'll just rub it back with some automotive polish and we'll see how it comes up. This is the cutting compound I'm going to use. It's machine buffing and hand rubbing, so it's, it's fairly coarse. So I'll just try a bit. Mm. And you can see the baker like melting off with it. Wow. So this has been um, subjected to some sun, I would think. It's it's almost got a layer on it. I've probably spent uh, 45 seconds doing that. Let's see if it'll come off. Well there it is, it's better. It's not fantastic. I really think this is a poor casting of the uh, Bakelite. 
Now there's a little scratch there, I was hoping it would kind of buff out but it hasn't. So I'm going to sand that with a bit of very fine wet and dry, polish it up again and we should be able to get rid of that I hope. I've got a bit of P1200 wet and dry, I'm not sure what that equates to in American wet and dry, this is the European standard. Look, uh, uh, that mark's still there, I don't want to go too far in case I go through the crust of the Bakelite into the stuff inside, so uh, I'm going to live with that. I'll keep going with this coarse buffing compound and uh, when it's finished I'll show you. Uh, there'll be another couple of operations to do after that and get this back as well as we possibly can. Well that's it, it's nothing flash, it's not the best Bakelite case I've ever seen. Uh, it's come up okay, there's stains in the Bakelite, I don't know if that's from manufacturer or what. Anyway, I'll move on to the next level of polish. This is a cut and polish so it's really just to bring back faded paint and things like that, brighten your car up. So it's not very abrasive. Now I've just applied it up to here and there's a line there that um, looks much better than that side so maybe it's not going to come up too bad at all. So I'll keep going, do the rest of it and we'll come back and have a look. I've done the rest of the case in uh, the cut and polish and uh, it's come up pretty well. Um, it's still a rubbish <laughs> moulding but um, you know, lots of marks in it anyway. Uh, but it's come up okay. What I'll do now is uh, put some brass hoe on it. I'll just do half again like I did last time and we'll see what the difference is between the cut and polish and the brass hoe. Now once again I've just polished this area here up to this line and it's a little bit better, it's not fantastic but it's a bit better so I will continue with the Brasso and there might be another step I can do after that I've put Brasso all over it, it's still a pretty awful looking case it's got discoloration in it, I don't know um, so what I'm going to do to try and cover that up is I've done this before, this is Canaba Wax and it's got a brown tint in it so it helps to level it out and give it a bit of a shine if it's gone dull so I'll try putting that on So I'll let that um, dry for about 10 minutes or so and give it a buff and we'll see how that comes up. Alright, that's a clear improvement there. So, so once again, just let me finish this off with the Canaba wax and uh, we'll come back and inspect it. I've put the wax on and it's come out pretty good. It's not going to win any awards, or not any good awards anyway, but um, yeah, it's not bad. So that'll look quite nice. Now the next thing I need to do is make a new lens for this dial. I need to make a lens for this radio so I've just whipped up a little mould here, a uh, male and a female part, and I've got a bit of uh, plastic um, and I'll put that on there, put that on there and squash it together after I've heated it up. Now this plastic I got from a hobby shop and it's what the modelers use to make canopies for their little model aeroplanes. So uh, it's quite flexible and a tough sort of feeling. Uh, I was able to cut this with a pair of scissors. So I'm going to put that on there. Put that on there. Now I've got a little oven here I've got specially for doing this sort of thing. There we go. And I'll put that on, uh, run it to about 135 or so, that'll do. I'll let that warm up and I'll come back in 20 minutes and see if it'll press together. Alright, that's it, let's see how it went. I haven't used this plastic before, I can see it wrinkled up there, so I don't know if that means anything. Uh, so I'm going to leave this for, I don't know, 20 minutes again, let it cool right off and see how it comes out. Okay, let's see how it went, it's cooled off pretty much. Well, 
it's done a pretty good job but it's marked it with the wood uh, the last plastic I used didn't do that so I didn't worry too much but uh, clearly I need to finish that off a bit better but the actual shape is pretty good uh, I need to work out how to smooth this off perfectly uh, maybe put some paper on it or something and I'll give it another go while I was waiting for the lens to cool I've put the handle back on and I've fitted the little light or jewel or whatever they called it but I want to see if this is going to fit before I bother about making another bit another one oh, it's perfect it's absolutely that's perfect fits perfectly all right good if I take a little bit more time making the mold I wouldn't have things like staples across it and I probably didn't need to put 13 metric tons of pressure on it either uh, I think that's what's what's happened really is uh, it's had too much pressure on it so where there was no pressure it's clear as a bell so I'll learn from all that all right ready for take two I filled up all the little defects in the in the timber there and smoothed all this out in here I've cut another bit of plastic and what I found is this protective uh, skin on there, film, um, you can heat it up. I didn't think it would take the heat, but I heated that pretty warm with a heat gun to the point where it just bent, um, and it just peels off and underneath is perfectly good. So I kind of leave it on. Maybe that's its design feature. Uh, perhaps I should have researched this a bit better. Anyway, I'm going to do all the same things again. I'll heat it up, but I'll leave the film on this time, and we'll see how we go with that. Okay, let's uh, put it in for 20 minutes again. I'll turn that down to uh, 130, that seemed to be where we're at, or 135, that'll do. Alright, well, I'll let that sit for about half an hour till it cools and we'll have a look again. Alright, that's cooled off a fair bit, I'll see how it went. All right. Yeah, okay. It's still got some marks in the middle where those uh, staples were very close and it still doesn't need as much pressure as I'm putting on it. So uh, that's something I don't, I don't need to put as much pressure on. Very close though. So I've got at least three more attempts. <laughs> I'll uh, keep going and we'll do another one tomorrow morning. I'm going to have another go at this lens. Um, I've taken the staples out of the mould here. And this is how it's made. I had that bit of cardboard there just to give it a bit of height. I, this uh, wood wasn't thick enough. So I've had a bit of cardboard there. And that's on both sides, the male and the female side. And what I've done now is made another piece of cardboard. And I'm going to sandwich that in as well. And that'll just lift that off so there's, it's not pushing the, um, the plastic hard against here. It just gives it a little bit of clearance. And uh, that's only, it's not even a mill thick. So I'm going to staple that on there and we'll give it another shot. I've just filled this damage with uh, some body filler and smoothed it off. It's quite smooth now. So I've got a bit of plastic in there. I've left the uh, film on it and uh, I'll put it in there. I'm, I might only heat it to 100 degrees. I think it, uh, it'll melt easily at 100 degrees. Uh, this is a totally different plastic than what I'm used to. Alright, we'll give this one a go. And that's it. That's all it needs. I was putting way too much pressure on that. All right, I'm going to leave that for about half an hour. I think this will work better. It's I could see it actually push down this time. Uh, and I have got a clamp on here, but it's very, very light. It's just holding it there. So I'll see you in half an hour. All right, let's see what's happened this time. Fingers crossed. There it is. Yeah, that looks good. I think that looks good. All right, I think we've got it. Um, it has got some little dots on it, and I, I think that's from this plastic. I am not sure. That's come out really good. It's just got the little dots on it, which kind of detract a little bit. I'm going to have a go, and I won't put the film on this time. Uh, worst case is, I'll just use this one. Okay, let's have a look at this attempt. It looks pretty good so far. Uh, at the last minute I put a bit of um, silicon paper or baking paper in there just to maybe try and protect it but uh, may have damaged it more than anything. Uh, I gotta say that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. 
Yeah, there's a couple of little... Oh, golly, you're really pushing to see them. So it's not 100% perfect. I would say it's about 98%. I'm going to cut that out and glue it in my radio. I've trimmed all the edges here and we'll see if it fits in the radio. Now I'm just using a tissue here. I don't want to get my fingers all over it. So uh, yeah, it looks good and it fits really well. It doesn't move side to side. So I'm going to glue it in and move on to the next bit. Now something else I need to address is this pointer. Uh, this is what was in there. This is not the original as far as I can tell. Uh, the originals had a far bigger pointer than this. I don't know what this is off. But it's drilled off centre and it's got bits missing around the sides. It's quite a mess. So I printed one out, a pointer, and tried to <laughs> recreate. This looks very similar to what's on the other radios I've seen. Uh, there's not a lot of around with this double pointer, but uh, the ones I did see had this sort of uh, Art Deco looking finish on them with the hexagonal in the middle so I've recreated that uh, for the pointers I've just got some piano wire here which is quite tight there we go so I can put piano wire either side and maybe paint the ends red and I'll paint this gold which is what the pointers on the other um, radios I've seen have all been gold so there it is with both pointers on so I don't know I'll put this one aside for a minute. I'm going to go and paint this. I'll have to paint it with a plastic paint first. I don't even know if you can paint this um, printed plastic. Um, we'll see. It glues all right. Uh, I've glued, super glued it together okay. And there it is laid on the dial. So yeah, it doesn't look too bad, does it? So I might go with that. I'll give that a coat of paint and we'll see how it looks in the end. I can go back to the old one. Now my little replacement capacitors for my smoothing cap have arrived. So I'm going to do that. Here's the original tube and I've put a little cardboard blank in the end there and glued it in. I've got the capacitors here and uh, I've used the original wires and I've made a little 3D printed plug and uh, there it is there. And I've also gone crazy and made a little tube for it all to fit together. So uh, this is over the top. I, this is just me learning how to do 3D printing. So. Don't take any notice of that. And of course that all fits in there. There we go. But before I do, I'm going to glue all this together. Uh, now what I found is that super glue glues this plastic fairly well. So uh, I'll super glue this end and I'll put some hot glue on the end here just to, for no reason really. And I'll just put a drop of uh, super glue along here. More than a drop there. There we go. Put a blob of Hot glue on the bottom. I've let this dry for an hour, let the super glue dry. Uh, now this can go in here. Uh, the black has to go opposite the uh, green label there. So I've just lined that up. So what I'm thinking of doing is putting a bit of um, hot glue on the here somewhere and perhaps a bit there and there. Slide it in and that should hold it. I'm going to fill the top up with some hot glue as well. Okay, that's worked pretty well actually. I thought it was going to get stuck there for a second. Alright, uh, that's all cleaned up and that looks pretty good. Now I've got some um, what's supposed to be red hot glue and I'm just going to fill this top up but I'm not sure how well this is going to work. I thought I was going to lose that hot glue for a minute there but uh, the air gun sorted it out and it's got a nice smooth finish on it. I'll let it uh, cool off and it'll go a bit cloudy of course but at the moment it looks great. That's it, it's hardened off and uh, yeah it looks alright. It's uh, not authentic I guess but I needed to seal that up and hold it in so uh, that seemed like a good option. So I'm going to install this on the radio. Uh, there's a couple of other little things to do and then we might turn it on and see if it works. I've soldered that capacitor in, soldered the wires in so we're ready to go with that. Um, I got a delivery of these cross the line X caps here so 
I've fitted one of those. I can't see any reason why we can't try and power this up now. Um, I'll just turn it on here. I'll move that there. I've just put that uh, dial on there for reference. I've got my power supply on dim bulb. Uh, there's an isolation transformer, of course. I've set it to 120 volts, roughly. Let's see what happens. Keep your eye on the bulb. And that looks pretty good. It came on bright and it's dimming off. So that looks good. Um, I don't know if you can see it. There's a very dim light in the bulb that'll come up, hopefully. And I'm not hearing anything. Uh, we've got 91 volts on there. It's a bit of a hum. It's got a bit of hum. Yeah, there it goes. Well, there's something there. That volume controls louder when it's down than it is when it's up. Hang on, just see if I can get the mic down a bit closer. You can hear uh, Susie singing Can a Can very, very softly, which is unusual for Susie. No, that's not working properly. Um, now it could be that uh, dodgy 12 SK7 in there. Now my very limited experience says that even the worst valve will still do something. So it should be better than that. It can't be the valve. Well, it can be. What I'll do is I'll go to full power and we'll see what happens. Everything's working properly. 12 watts is pretty good. It's a bit louder but that's about all. And if something's not right here, that could be that valve but it would be foolish to just I suspect that's what it is. Um, I'll have a look underneath. I've turned this upside down. Here's the center tap of the volume control. That goes off to the uh, the uh, triode in the detector valve here, or triode and detector. And if I put my finger on there, I've got a screwdriver that's conductive, but make sure I don't get electrocuted. It should hum. It's not doing anything. Um, so that would say the amplifier part's not working, which is pretty obvious by the volume. Nothing there. That should be going to the triode. I've got my oscilloscope going. Um, this is the center tap of the volume control. So we've got the audio signal. There it is there. Yeah. Uh, there's the other side of that capacitor. So it should have the same signal there. We haven't. We haven't got the same. Oh, maybe that, is that capacitor? Cool. It's not even getting across the capacitor. Oh, hang on. That capacitor is 222, so it's a 0 0.002. Uh, according to the drawing, that's correct. Yeah, so it's not getting across there. That's where I'm putting my oscilloscope on that point there, that uh, wiper. There's C15, which is a 0.002, that's okay. Uh, so that capacitor must be crook. What's that number, pin 2? So, yeah, and that's going straight in the triode and then off to the grid here. Uh, so that capacitor's going there. It's going through a 15 meg resistor. Why is it going through a resistor? What? There's no, shouldn't be a resistor there. Uh, it's a capacitor. There's no resistor in that line. What's going on? Hang on. Sorry, I have another look. What's that? Pin 2. Pin 2. There's a resistor there. Let's have a look at that. There's R9 there, 15 meg. No, 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 what's going on? Oh, right, okay. What I've done is I've put this capacitor on the wrong spot. That's going to the cathode. So obviously that's going virtually straight to ground. Uh, so it's surprising it's actually working at all. Okay, let me <laughs> change that over to there. Oh, look at that. 
Yeah, yeah, there, there it is there. Okay, that's the problem. I've corrected my mistake there. I'll turn it over. All right, I've got this turned over again. Uh, I've got the volume up a bit. I'm pretty confident this is going to work. Power on. Oops, I probably should have gone through the dim bulb since I played with it. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Margie, who's his favourite player? Or who, who has it been over the years? Um, well, he, he did, he, you know, he looked up to Jared Lockyer so much, you know, so much so that my husband used to think that was his father. He could tell you anything about John and Lockyer. Forty metres in the middle of the field. What he was yep. putting in, and he he was one of Queensland's best. Well, and we all know that he was driven by a desire to unhinge Payne after the series, because as they were coming through the ranks, Payne was always the glam boy who got the Broncos. We're just talking about the State of Origin uh, match last night in the Rugby League. Uh, Queensland won the series, and a bit of celebration on in the city this morning. But the radio is working. That's the main thing. Whoa! Just looking for defensive line. They can work nice. Yeah. So that's that's good. And that's got that crummy valve in it. Uh, as I said before, even the worst valves still seem to work pretty well. <laughs> yeah, ultimately. Now, what I did notice while it was upside down is that it had a crashing noise in it, which sounded all the world like silver mica disease. Now, silver mica disease is often in these little IF cans. But this one's got um, adjustable capacitors, so it still could be in there. Not so bad if it's in those, I guess. Uh, otherwise, it may be another silver mica somewhere, but it hasn't come back. It's not there now. So I've just moved it off station there, and there's, there's no, um, no hint of it, so we'll just see if it comes back. What I normally would do now is the alignment, but I've done it to death on the last few videos, so what I might do is just do it off camera. I'll put 455 through here. If it's okay, I'll just move on. After that, I'll just feed a signal in at 600 and 1400 and uh, just make sure the dial's tracking properly and pick the antenna and that's it. So I won't show that in its entirety. Uh, if I need to make any small adjustments, I'll show it then. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll move on to putting it back together. Now I said I wasn't gonna do the alignment, but I've turned it on and there's an issue already. Now I've just connected my signal generator through a loop antenna. I've just pegged it on the back of the radio's antenna. I've connected my multimeter as well. I've got the generator on 455. And when I turn it up, nothing there. So obviously it's not set to 455. So what I'll do is I'll run my signal generator up and down until we find the signal, assuming it's working of course. So I'll just turn it up again. And see what we can get. Go the other way, there he comes. Turn that off. So I'll turn the noise off there. Um, so that's it there, so 437, couldn't get much further out. The IF is 455, so I'm gonna to have to adjust it. So I'll get this loop antenna off and I'll feed it straight into the mixer, I'll come back. Now I've just wired the signal generator straight into the top of the cap here, that's going straight into the mixer. So I'll just put the generator back on 455. I'll, do. I'll, I'll adjust the IF trimmers here uh, until we get it back and I'll put the sound back on there we go, might help so I'll just start here yeah, that's one turn the sound off Alright, so I've got them basically where they should be. We're still on 455, so now I'll just trim it up uh, exactly, and that'll be it.
All right. Now I'm going to run through them again and probably again. Uh, we'll come back when I finish that and have a look. All right, I managed to get a tiny bit more out of it, um, so I'm happy with the IF part of it. We'll move on to the RF. I do have the instructions for aligning this, and I've gone back to the loop antenna, and that's being induced into the main antenna on the radio. Here's the two adjustments we're going to look at now. One's the oscillator, which is that one, and the other one's the antenna, which is that one. Now, to do the RF, I've set that pointer to zero, and that's my new pointer. I've sprayed it, and it comes pretty good. Colour's a bit strange. Uh, anyway, it, it looks okay. Now, I've got instructions for this, and it says to set it at 1425. As there is no 1425, I'm going to set it to 1400. Now, I need to set my signal generator to 1400 as well. Oh, that's good. There you go. So, I'll adjust this. This is the oscillator. I'll do this first. See if we can get it closer than that. I'll just turn it up a bit. I'll turn that off. Turn it down a little. Turn it down a little. I've got the signal generator on minimum. Wow. This is way out. There it is. All right, that's it. Uh, now, this will be the antenna, so we'll just adjust this to maximum. And that's about right. So, I wonder why they're all wrong. Now the next thing to do is go around to 600 and we just check to make sure that it's lined up at 600. If it's not, there is an adjustment. So I'll just wind this around to 600, just down there somewhere. And I'll set my signal generator to 600. That'll do. If I turn it up, we should hear it. I'll turn the speaker on. There it is. Yep. Perfect. That's spot on. Okay, well that's the full alignment. There is nothing else to do. There is an adjustment for adjusting that 600, and you won't believe this, but if you needed to adjust that 600 point, you would take uh, this wire here, this loose wire, and you move it around, move it to the center to get it to uh, resonate at the 600 when you want it. So that's it for the alignment. I'll take all this test gear off. We'll just give it a quick run, see if it's working properly. All right, let's see how we went storms tomorrow for the northwest, southwest and the east coast north of about Rockhampton. Fine or mostly fine elsewhere. Brisbane 19 to 29. The Gold Coast 19 to 28. The Sunshine Coast 18. Social distance. 55, 440 for six bank book, three whiz kev 550, eight dollars. Yeah, getting a fair bit of noise in here. If I took it outside, it'd be fine. I'm in Victoria, listed for sale, and it's missing a kitchen roof. Oh, well, there you go. She's lost her roof. All right, uh, this seems to be working all right. I just need to change the power cord that uh, arrived this morning, so I'll put a new power cord on it and we can put it in its case and see how it looks. Right, I've installed a polarised plug into the radio, I fitted a fuse, uh, I rewired it so the active went through the switch, so when this is switched off, uh, there's no power on the radio at all, apart from up to here. If I'd left it the way they had it, uh, then there would have been power on here all the time, uh, waiting for someone to touch it. So. Uh, that's a bit safer. The only concern is introducing hum by running the active right through the middle of the radio. So I've kept the uh, wire away as far as I can. Uh, the wire going up to the rectifier, I've uh, snugged it onto the chassis as best I can. And I've tested the radio, it's working very, very well. Uh, there's no hum introduced by, by putting the wiring this way, so uh, I'm happy to put it together. There's just one thing I'll show you before I do. Now, as uh, with all my radios, once I'm happy it's electrically safe, I plug it into the mains and test it, make sure everything's working okay. With this one, of course, it's 120 odd volts. Uh, I need to use a step-down transformer. So I use one of these um, transformers here. This drops it down to 110 from, I don't know, 130, I guess. It's called a step-up, step-down. I don't see how you can uh, step up with it because there's no provision to do that. These are universal sockets, so you can fit any plug in there. 
but they are marked N, L, and there's the earth symbol. So I took my new polarized plug, wide blade on the neutral, plugged it in there, turned it on. And what I've done is plug my multimeter lead into the earth on our main socket and touch the chassis. There's 119 volts on it. So if I take that out and put it in the other plug, wide blade to neutral. And now when I test it, it's got one and a half volts or so AC. I've taken the cover off. This is the front here and these are the two sockets. Now what they've done is put a link between the two pins. So this one here is an active pin on this uh, socket and the one over this side, the far side, is the neutral. So they've just linked active and neutral together. The point I want to make is if you're in a country trying to run uh, low voltage stuff and you need to have a polarized plug, um, check these first because they may not be right. I'm still short a few parts like the valve and a capacitor, uh, but I don't see any reason why I can't put this back in the house and we'll have a look at it finished. All right, let's do it. Uh, I'll push that in. Now, I've got to lift the handle up to get the dial past the handle. There we go. Now, I've put the screws in on the bottom. Let's put the knobs on. I'll put the back on as well. Okay, that's done. I'll turn around, we'll have a look. There it is, I've turned off some of the lights for a minute so we can see the dial. I'll just turn it on. It's warmed up, I'll turn it up a bit. A whole lot of love on the Border Collies of Brisbane um, in, on their Facebook. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if they meet in person. Maybe it's... I'll just tune up to the next station. I'm not going to muck around too much. Radio Brisbane. 1300 is my number. That's That is working exceptionally well. It sounds good in the case. Now a little indicator. It looks alright. Um, I probably could have put a little bit more work into it. I think I need to sand it back a little. It's a bit rough. Uh, I'll sand it back again. I think I'll come up with a different colour gold. It's just not right. But um, yeah, it's not bad. 3D printed. Yeah, got me out of trouble. Now here's a little red indicator. Uh, it's flashing because I've turned the exposure down so you can see it as red. Uh, it's coming out white with the exposure on normal. So if I put it back to normal, it just goes away. So I have no idea what year this is. Um, but I haven't seen one with this little uh, ruby or jewel or whatever they called it. And it's listed in the parts, I think, unless I'm mistaking what the part is. Now, I don't know if these are the correct knobs. Uh, they may be the right ones. Uh, I've seen two or three different styles. Uh, some look similar to this, but they're more pointed in the center. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So they may not be right. Uh, that's it for this one. And it's an Emerson 518 from America. Uh, built between 40 and 46. I haven't been able to determine the uh, date. I've done a few of these AC, DC hot chassis sets in the last few weeks. And I've quite enjoyed it. I was sort of looking forward to doing something like this. So very happy with the result with this one. And nice, neat little compact radio. It's quite a cute radio to sit at home. Now I had a bit of fun with this one. Made a lens for the dial, restuffed the capacitor, stuff like that. Uh, always good to just try something new. I enjoyed doing this and I hope you enjoyed watching it and I hope you can join me for my next radio adventure.